everyone i am palak sharma and i welcome all of you once again to the global public policy program 2021 by center for policy studies at jk lakshmi path university in collaboration with the school of public policy at the university of massachusetts amherst for today's session on the moon the ghetto and artificial intelligence enacting digital government I studied public policy at the Netherlands School of Economics, UK, and I'm the program manager of the LSEF UMass Scholarship Program. It selects a cohort of exceptional scholars every year, offering them a generous scholarship to pursue a master's in public policy or resource economics or data analytics in computational social science, which first year at JKLU in India and the second at UMass in Hurst. For those of all who are interested, the details can be found at our website. www.lse.foundation the lecture today is an interesting one and it is the second in this series which will comprise of five part packed and interactive sessions by some of the most inspiring and accomplished faculty and public policy professionals from UMass Amherst today's lecture is by professor jane fountain she is a renowned american political scientist and technology theorist She is the distinguished university professor of public policy and an adjunct distinguished professor by appointment in the College of Information and Computer Sciences at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Before joining the faculty at the UMass Amherst, Professor Fountain served for 16 years on the faculty of the John F Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. a former radcliffe institute for advanced study yale university and mellon foundation fellow she holds masters degree from harvard and yale university and a phd from yale professor fountain was named in the list of the 100 most influential people in digital government in 2018 and 19 by a political and was named a federal 100 awardee in 2013 She served as political science department chair from 2015 to 2018 and interim director of the Center for Public Policy and Administration from 2006 to 2007. Professor Fountain's publications have appeared in journals including Public Administration Review, Behavioral Science and Policy, Governance, Communications of the ACM, Science and Public Policy and Technology and Society. Among other publications she is the author of Building the Virtual State Information Technology and Institutional Change which was awarded an outstanding academic title by Choice and has been translated into Chinese Portuguese Japanese and Spanish Professor Fountain's current research is focused on institutions and digitalization specifically on cross boundary and emergent institutional arrangements In line with this very theme our session for today will be on enacting digital government a gentle reminder for all our participants and attendees you can post your questions in the Q&A box while the speaker delivers her lecture your questions will then be picked in the order of occurrence to be answered on the speaker's discretion after the speaker lecture ends i would now request uh, our eminent faculty members from jk lakshmipath university to give a note or the address to professor fountain and professor alisdar roberts who is the director of the school of public policy before the session begins thank you thank you palak uh, at at jklu and lakshmipath singhania uh, education foundation our mission is to make the best education in the world accessible to students from india and we are fortunate to have the support of university of massachusetts amherst one of the top ranked public universities in the us in this mission on behalf of both jklu and the foundation i'm delighted to welcome professor jane fountain and professor alisdair roberts both leading academics and uh, public policy experts from the university of massachusetts amherst uh, thanks professor roberts the who's really the architect of this program for joining us today your lecture last week was the perfect kick off to this global public policy program uh, professor fountain today is speaking on a topic which is uh, you know which is extremely relevant in the current policy environment and we in india and i'm sure around the world you know see the confluence of uh, governance and uh, and digitalization in our in our daily lives as well and like everyone i'm so looking forward to hear from her uh, she also teaches by the way a course to students of the umass jklu program in their first year at jklu and it's a privilege for us to have her here uh, back to you palak 
Thank you very much, sir, for your kind words. I would now request Professor Jane to begin with her session and enlighten us with her words and knowledge. Thank you. Um, and I'm hoping I can share my screen. Yes, yes. Yes, okay. Uh, so let's see how this will go. Uh, should be it. Thank you very much for the very warm and kind introduction. <clears throat> I'm so pleased to, to be with you today and to uh, speak across the miles. Um, I was asked to say something about uh, this topic and why this title. And um, uh, we, will, we will get to that in the talk. Uh, um, so without further ado, let's, let us begin. Um, a bit about a background because um, after that wonderful introduction, you don't need it. Uh, this is a book that was published um, 2001, so about 20 years ago. And um, just to show the speed of technological change and the uh, uh, coming to grips, uh, trying to absorb new uh, technologies in governance and in society. When I first finished this manuscript and sent it out, um, I sent it to the Brookings Institution, which is one of our top think tanks because I wanted the book to be read by policymakers as well as scholars. Their initial response was, we don't know how to categorize this book. We don't know where we would put it in our offerings. We don't know what the topic is. <laughs> <laughs> and we don't know what the subject is. So only 20 years ago, um, we had very limited knowledge. And uh, during the past 20 years, many scholars around the world have been building um, this topical area called e-government, digital government, technology and government. It goes by many names. One of the surprises for me and the reason the translations are up is because the book is has three case studies in it, as well as conceptual and theoretical work, but they are, they are US-based case studies. What I found in giving many, many talks around the world, which I've been very privileged uh, to do, is that other uh, policymakers in other countries have readily seen the situations in their own countries in this conceptual framework. So it was wonderful validation that the theory and the framework uh, spoke to other political economies and other, other cultures. For about eight years or so, uh, I was a chair, vice chair, uh, member of the <clears throat> Global Agenda Council on the Future of Government for the World Economic Forum. And there too, um, there was a lot of dialogue about what ideas have purchase in what countries and what regions of the world. And um, one of the takeaways, so there are many of them, but one of them was uh, there are some distinctions. Professor Roberts may have talked about this a little bit last week, I don't know. There are distinctions between how we are building out the future of government, obviously, in democratic countries versus um, how these new technologies are playing out and being used in more authoritarian or high control countries. And you will see some of that in the examples uh, today, at least on the US, US side. Um, <clears throat> it was mentioned in the introduction that I've worked on cross-agency collaboration uh, from about 2012, 2013. Um, it is becoming more and more obvious that our technological tools allow us to build databases that span across organizations, institutions, countries, and our ways of working have needed to catch up with the ability to share data and to share operations broadly and in networked settings. So this work was a, um, an ability to, uh, an attempt to document and also to recommend to uh, US federal government and other governments how to build whole of government approaches or uh, even below whole of government cross-agency approaches that may also include other sectors um, the private sector, the nonprofit sector, civil society, as well as government institutions. 
And that I think is really an ongoing frontier for um, governmental institutions. I've also worked a bit on uh, technologies for building citizenship. Many people like to talk about the empowerment that the internet and web and social media bring to citizens. It's something that we have to consider obviously as, a, as an important research area. Um, I'll skip over these. There are other lines of work that feed into today's talk. Um, this is an old, well, conceptual framework from, from that book. What I want to highlight here is that what we will be talking about today, what I will be talking about is enacted technology, technology in use. Um, one can consider the affordances, the dimensions, the um, uh, possibilities um, of objective in information technologies. That is what the technology allows one to do its functionality, its potential. But generally when technologies and technological systems are used in government or for governance, they are being mediated through organizations and institutional arrangements. I also want to point out um, this view of code, which I believe comes from Larry Lessing's book, Code, that code, computer code software is a simplified biased representation of reality. It is a collection of rule setting operations and functions that represent judgments regarding how things should work. In other words, code produced by humans reflects their human prejudices, understandings, misunderstandings. When we get to machine learning and artificial intelligence, as many of you will know, we can have machines that produce code. I'll be talking more about that. So the, the impetus for this line of research is in part to look at computational algorithms as and how they are enacted and to take this view of code and to see how and to what extent and in what ways it translates into this new world of big data, machine learning, artificial intelligence. Uh, so now, why the title? Well, the title is stolen. I will, I will fully admit it to you. The title is taken from a book that was published, a small monograph in 1977, a very long time ago, um, be well before all the students here were born, um, by a, a quite famous um, economist, an evolutionary economist, um, Richard Nelson. Richard Nelson is also uh, an interesting scholar because he is in one of the world's experts on national innovation systems and has done comparative research on um, national innovation systems. What makes one country more innovative than another and what are the dimensions of their innovation system? In this book called The Moon in the Ghetto, so now you know where the title comes from, <clears throat> he begins with a question, if we can land a man on the moon or a woman, uh, why can't we solve the problems of the ghetto? What this question came out of were um, years, the 60s and the 70s, of using what at that time were quite advanced statistical and other quantitative methods, optimization, forecasting, cost-benefit analysis, the kinds of, um, and more, um, including computational analysis. Um, and by the way, artificial intelligence goes back to the late 1950s. So people are applying artificial intelligence at this time as well. It's, it turns out that computational methods work very, very well on well-structured, well-defined problems. The types of problems we might find in biomedical research, in aeronautics and astronautics, in the sciences where you can define something very precisely. And then um, as in the case of, of getting someone to the moon or now getting someone to Mars, um, you can keep working that problem in a very structured systematic way. When it comes to the problems of the ghetto, and it's, it's, it's a bit, um, anyway, the, the term is, is meant as a figure of speech to stand in for poverty, for social and economic inequalities that seem to be 
intractable that seem to be very difficult for societies to, to solve. Um, that these quantitative methods uh, allow some insights. They are um, useful in some respects, but they don't quite get at those problems as well because those problems tend to be uh, relatively unstructured. They come under the category of wicked problems. There are multiple stakeholders. There are multiple understandings of what the problem even is. The um, causal connections are not clear. The problem is policymakers call these squishy problems. You push on one part of the problem, you create externalities in another part of the problem. And so these are, these are problems of a different type than the type of problem of getting someone to the moon or Mars or wherever we're going next. Um, so I return to his book to um, uh, look more in detail about uh, what his thinking was at that time and whether it would help us during this period in which we are launching big data and computational algorithms. And I think it is helpful. So let's talk about um, inequalities and institutional biases. I'm watching time because I, uh, I could talk with you for three hours, but I'll try to keep this short. Many of you will know uh, Thomas Piketty's book published in 2013 called Capital, where he pointed out um, that social and economic inequalities have been increasing. Second important point is that these increases, if not checked and controlled, would lead to political instabilities. And I think some of the political instability that we are seeing in the United States and in other parts of the world is a result of rapid technological change, changes in um, social and economic inequalities and exacerbation of them, especially for what some people have called the knowledge have nots, the people who are not being lifted up by information societies and digital tools. Um, in parallel with that, the promise has always been, or the hype has always been, that the internet and web would lead to greater empowerment for people, that it would erase some of these inequalities, that it would um, harbor in many, many benefits. But we have to interrogate this very carefully because what we see is um, more and more sophisticated technologies, but more and more inequalities. Um, this is just a G7 and I'll, I'll gloss over this very quickly. Um, share of income earned by the top 1%. That blue line at the top of the slide, you can see it's a fairly dramatic slope. We're going from 1975, it cuts off at 2015. I can tell you that you could extrapolate out the slope. If you normalize, it doesn't change very much. It keeps going up. So this, um, this is another way of depicting that even with the internet and web and advanced information technologies, um, the policy choices, including uh, financial uh, and monetary policy choices that are made by decision makers, have a lot to do with where the wealth and productivity that is created will end up. Um, it's not just uh, uh, a natural matter that um, things would become more equal. In fact, they will tend to become more unequal as we see. And this is from a, a talk by Jason Furman, who was the chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors during the Obama administration. And it was specifically a talk about the policy challenges of um, introducing and exploiting, strategically exploiting the benefits of artificial intelligence and how if we didn't pay attention in the policy realm that we would simply increase um, these inequalities. The other table, which I won't go over for reasons of time, is about labor productivity growth and where the benefits of that productivity growth are going. Um, it turns out they're not going to benefit labor, they're going to, to benefit others. Um, as we look forward, and I won't fully motivate um, these few slides, um, as artificial intelligence, as robotics uh, are further um, absorbed and uh, exploited to uh, change um, automation in factories, in manufacturing, in businesses. We already know a lot, researchers already know a lot about the potential for job loss 
Um, and here, again, without going into detail, is a map down to the county level in the United States, obviously, uh, showing the potential for um, automation replacing particular types of jobs in particular occupational categories. And this um, figure down in the bottom right hand of the page even breaks out those categories by race and by ethnicity across um, occupational categories. <coughs> so we can get a very precise look by county at um, what types of occupations are likely to be affected. And the prognosis is that there will be quite uh, a major adjustment. And these adjustment periods, if you study other technological change, the first industrial revolution, this is called the fourth industrial revolution, tend to go on for many years, 40, 50 years. The pace of absorption can be rapid in some ways, slow in other ways, and many, many people will be left behind. So we have to think about how we're going to structure our policies to mitigate the greatest harms and to bring the greatest benefits from these technologies. So what about computational algorithms? AI is simply the area of computer science that seeks to um, get computers to imitate intelligent human behavior from challenging uh, grandmasters in chess to learning systems, uh, to robotics, to any number of things. We're going to be looking specifically at a few areas today. Machine learning is a technique in AI in which um, the system, the computer system, the algorithm is said to be able to learn. It does that in a very um, simple way, actually, although the computation, it requires quite powerful computers. Um, you take a database and the um, um, computer identifies uh, positive correlations, negative correlations in this huge big database that's been given to it. It then infers the rules by which those associations were produced. Those are, that is the algorithm. algorithm. Um, the algorithms are often used to make predictions. That's predictive analytics. Um, and then the outcomes of those predictions are fed back into the program, and that is meant to allow the program to refine and improve, that is to learn. So that's what we mean by machine learning in the most simple terms. We have many, many different terms that are used more or less interchangeably, big data, algorithmic decision-making, machine learning, um, and related uh, techniques. Um, Part of the promise of this for government, and this is a, a quote from a um, Helen Margitz and Cosmina Dorobantu article, is that governments collect enormous amounts of data about their citizens. And if we could exploit these data, analyze these data to make useful predictions, we could improve education, healthcare, uh, traffic safety, drive down crime, uh, help children who are uh, in need um, by developing models um, that would allow us to control, um, basically, uh, and to operate our societies in a much more systematic way. In part, that is true, but there are, are some externalities. Um, for one thing, uh, and this will be the, the main theme of the talk, there is a, a good deal of discrimination, of bias in these algorithms. Um, and John Kleinberg and others have, have written on this um, extensively. Interestingly, much of this line of work are computer and information scientists publishing in law journals. Why? Because in the United States, we have very strict and clear laws that prohibit discrimination um, by different categories, gender, race, ethnicity, age, disability. And so if inside these mysterious machine learning models, there is discrimination going on, that would be illegal. But it's difficult to get inside these models because they tend to be opaque and proprietary models are not open. It's difficult to examine the databases from which these models are built 
And so you have a difficulty proving discrimination. Um, nevertheless, we can see its impacts um, and we see them in a variety of places. Um, I'm gonna go more quickly now for reasons of time. This is not something just noticed in the United States. You can find these lines of, of research and commentary around the world. This is from a digital summit that was held in Tallinn. Um, and you will see a similar refrain in this area. AI is only as good as the data or environment it learns from. AI learns from what is called training data. The database can be enormous. The database can include uh, the internet of things, visual data, sensor data, geographic data. This is part of the, the great potential that you could combine all of these different types of data and to see if we can learn more from those data than just text or numeric databases. Many of the databases that are used, particularly in social issues, include the biased or discriminatory outcomes of past decisions. So they are, in a sense, a record of, of racial, ethnic, gender, age, other forms of biases. And so what we've done is let computers loose in machine learning to basically infer the rules by which those biased decisions were made. Um, so it should be no surprise that they're producing biased results. Let me take you through a few um, illustrations and then talk about some of the ways uh, forward in this realm. First, facial recognition or face recognition. Here is Joy Bolomwini, a researcher at the MIT Media Lab who begins uh, evaluating and doing research on facial recognition technologies. She first finds that many of the uh, technologies she's looking at from Microsoft, from Amazon, from other major vendors, don't seem to recognize her face very well. She thinks at first it might be because of the lighting. She thinks it might be because of something in her computer or, or her setting. She comes to realize that the accuracy rate or the ability to even recognize uh, a black face, the face of a person of color, um, is not very well accomplished by these technologies. Um, here's a, here are accuracy results for 2018 for the Amazon recognition system, which is a very widely used system. They're a vendor for many companies. And by the way, they don't release the companies that they have uh, licensed or sold uh, there who are using this system. So there's an opacity here. Um, and they did not allow the US National Institute for Standards and Technology, NIST, to verify and validate the accuracy of their system. Um, we are in unregulated territory here in the United States right now. Um, what Bulamwini and others and NIST verified this found that the accuracy rate is very high for lighter males. It's just slightly less accurate for darker males, slightly less accurate for lighter females, but the accuracy rate, as you can see, for darker females is very low. It's unacceptably low. You could not use this technology to identify or to do a match for uh, a woman of color. Um, here's the Microsoft um, facial recognition technology. Um, um, Bulamwini uh, fed in a, pap a photo of the young Michelle Obama. Uh, the Microsoft system thought, well, this is a young man. Uh, this young man is wearing a black shirt. I have no idea how it would come up with something like that. Um, and this individual must have some kind of hair piece, so it has no ability whatsoever to identify or understand here. What you should see here is that computers are stupid. They know only what they have been programmed to know. Um, and in these cases of facial recognition, they do a very poor job. Um, this research um, by Bulamwini and others uh, led to a series of uh, congressional hearings in the House Committee on Oversight and Reform on civil rights and facial recognition, as well as um, uh, facial recognition used in the commercial space 
and uh, for policing and for investigations. Um, but as yet, we have no laws, no direct laws about facial recognition or, or a way to regulate it um, as yet. But these hearings showed that we are really in the Wild West here. And the uses um, in um, uh, businesses um, and in policing, in investigations, and for surveillance are far, far out in front of the regulatory and legal structures that a country would need to exercise oversight in this area. Um, as the uh, calls for moratoria and bans on facial recognition grew, business groups pushed back. Um, and these are just some headlines. So this is about a year, a year and a half ago. Um, the, here's something more recent. It's just from a month ago. Uh, the state of Massachusetts recently passed legislation setting up some rules for facial recognition. So for federated governments that have central, state or provincial, and then local governance structures, what is, what is happening in the United States is that in the absence of federal rules, states and local governments are passing moratoria or prohibitions against facial recognition technologies, particularly for surveillance, and partly because they are inaccurate um, for some categories of people, but also because they seem to be used disproportionately on populations of color or minority populations. So they are exacerbating racial problems and problems of inequality. Brookline is a, a city outside of Boston, but I could show you these types of headlines for several cities in California, um, all other states on the West Coast. Um, companies are unhappy about these local moratoria or prohibitions because it creates a space across the United States that is inconsistent and a patchwork of different bans, prohibitions, various regulatory structures. Um, so while we have this vacuum at the federal level, this is what's occurring as state and local governments try to come to grips with this technology. Uh, just, I think, yesterday or the day before, uh, a group of uh, 40 civil rights groups uh, have requested the Biden administration to um, oppose facial recognition for mass tracking of individuals. Um, so this is a call for executive action. Um, I'll go on to policing and criminal justice now, but let me just say in terms of these bans, um, uh, legal researchers have said uh, I'm sure in India too, you have courts, you have a judiciary, you have executive functions and you have uh, legislative functions. Um, the, the, what we really want to see happen is congressional legislation and regulation, not just executive statements. Um, and there is the view that having uh, court cases provide the underlayment for some regulatory structure would be much too slow, that the technologies and their implementation are advancing too quickly for that to happen. Um, this is one case of many in the future of government where technologies and their use are far ahead of uh, governance and legal structures. Policing. An important, well, an important development, a major development in policing has been predictive policing. Um, and this is the idea that, uh, I'll come back here. This is the idea that you could use uh, computational methods to start to predict, well, first of all, to map where crime is occurring in say a city and uh, to deploy police according to where crimes are occurring. That seems logical. Um, what predictive policing uh, systems also will produce are, um, and these are in 24 hour periods. So the idea is to be very precise and quite granular um, that um, you could also produce risk profiles for individuals 
for known criminals, that is something that that um, policing and investigatory organizations have always done. But what these uh, the software also does is make predictions about who might commit a crime. And here in the US, this goes into problematic territory because we have due process and we presume people to be innocent until they are proven guilty. Uh, and we have um, very clear rules about probable cause uh, and again, a set of civil rights. So here the predictive policing is moving into territories that are um, really against US laws and um, constitutional uh, protections for individuals. There are other problems. Um, we're finding that predictive policing and its use tends to lead to over-policing in certain communities. Um, and now if you go back to my definition of machine learning, what is happening is that as police first respond to a neighborhood where there has been lots of reported crime, they deploy police to that neighborhood. The police naturally, because they're there and they're looking, are finding more crime. That's fed back into the predictive policing program, which um, then says, ah, we were right. And in fact, the problem is worse than we thought. So you're producing what are, are known in, in modeling as feedback loops. And these are runaway feedback loops. So there's very important work in this area by statisticians and mathematicians showing how this, exactly how this happens. Um, these feedback loops quickly grow out of control. So you're producing models that are no longer accurate and the biases in the models uh, become worse over time. Um, if you take the uh, predictive analytics used in these models and tie them to other areas, for example, uh, decisions that judges might make or that prisons might make about recidivism, um, you're getting similar data that is echoing through the system, producing uh, feedback loops that are very harmful for some people. So um, in New York, stop and frisk, just stopping people um, on, well, without even reasonable suspicion, led to documentation and variables and databases about an encounter with the police. There was no crime. Um, there was no, uh, um, there was no crime, but the person is now in a database and they become logged as a high risk. I see questions, so I'm going to look here. Digital divide, uh, neural monitoring. Um, okay, I'll try to work those in, thank you. Um, Jean, uh, if you want, you can take the questions later on. After you're done, we would like set aside 10 minutes for questions. You can continue with your own presentation for now. Okay. If you want to. Okay. Yeah. Um, let, let me move ahead as well. Sure. Yeah. Um, um, recent research as well is starting to look at this issue of over-policing. And here, this is the city of Oakland in California, Pacific Ocean. We're on the West Coast now. Um, and uh, the circle and this line is showing where uh, Oakland police, based on their predictive policing model, have been placing most of their attention. And the crimes here uh, that we're looking at are um, illicit drug use. So these are drug arrests. Um, and these predictive models look at various types of crimes and the risk of these types of crimes and then help police figure out how to deploy. The researchers here who are statisticians um, use other data, public health data and uh, drug use data to compose a map. Um, and these are frequently used by criminologists and in criminal justice. And they see that illicit drug use is far more widespread uh, and here again in Oakland, um, where the, the deeper the red, the more severe the problem, than what the Oakland police seem to be focusing on. Um, and if you were to look at these actual areas, you would see that these are high minority population areas and that many of these areas that have 
uh, a fair amount of illicit drug use are, are white areas. So those areas are escaping police attention and um, the biases um, are just leading to, to more racially biased, to put it in the, in the, the simplest way, uh, policing. And as, as you may know, if you have been following US uh, news at all, that we are looking into our, our policing, um, not to defund the police, but to try to understand better what is causing uh, these problems. And they're obviously, it's uh, quite complex, but one of them, um, something that we can identify are the way that predictive policing models um, may actually be harming communities rather than helping them. Um, so what has this led to? Uh, again, in the absence of federal legislation and regulation, uh, Oakland, this uh, city in California is the first, actually, I don't think they're quite the first, um, uh, to ban predictive policing and biometric surveillance. The picture of a man who is an activist who has been working on this issue with other um, civil society organizations saying that these um, technologies are harming the community. There's a line of research on the psychological harm that over-policing does and this identification of people who get rated as high risk um, when they have committed no crime who then have encounters with the police um, and then increase surveillance on their lives. It's very problematic. It's not a direction that, that we want to take in the United States. LAPD, Los Angeles Police Department, it's a very large city, obviously, um, also decided in April of last year to end their predictive policing uh, program. And PredPol software, which is what they were using, was developed by a UCLA professor, working with the police department. So very careful design of the software. Um, it was a, a, a GovTech winner um, um, for five straight years. So a very well regarded and used throughout the United States and probably in other countries as well. Um, but what the police department was experiencing was not only high cost of the program, these are vendor uh, owned programs, high, but also high inaccuracy rates, and then this increasing bias. Um, so going back to a point made earlier, the, uh, and I'm reading this in red from an article by Kleinberg um, et al., the Achilles heel of all algorithms are the humans who build them, the choices they make about the outcome variables, the candidate predictors, um, it's as if if you work on regression analysis or linear models, the same types of things you have to consider <clears throat> in modeling. What is your specification of the model? How are you defining your variables? How are you classifying your variables? At what point does something become high risk versus not high risk? Um, and what is the quality of the data? The I think the big mistake in early versions of big data was just that somehow magically computational algorithms and machine learning would sort out all those problems um, and uh, solve them. What we're seeing in many areas, especially these areas um, that Nelson called the ghetto, um, social areas, squishy areas, um, that these, these uh, models may not work very well, that they need a lot more work and attention. Um, screening algorithms. These are uh, pervasive. Um, these are the uh, predictive analytics used in housing, credit determinations, uh, deciding of those 10,000 resumes that a company got, who should uh, ascend to the finalist list and then get hired, healthcare uh, determinations, who will get into universities. Um, we're using predictive analytics risk analysis, eligibility models, selection models, more and more. And um, they are built in roughly the same way using machine learning and analytics. Um, sometimes they perform very well, but in all cases, they encode the biases that are in the database used to train them. In a report um, way back in the Obama administration on big data, um, this quotation is from that report. Um, 
policymakers understood that um, this is a potential problem. So this is not exactly a new problem. I'm going on too long, so I'm gonna go more quickly. And um, uh, I recommend this book to you. Um, Kathy O'Neill, who was a math professor at Columbia University, became uh, a hedge fund analyst on Wall Street in New York after 2008, the financial downturn. She realized the tremendous damage these models and other models were doing, and she began to study them as, a, as an area that's problematic. She identified three key problems with algorithmic tools. That is, they are opaque. It's hard to see the code. It's hard to, uh, it's impossible in many cases. Um, they are unregulated. <clears throat> they are difficult to contest. If a, a machine learning model decided that you were not a good candidate uh, <clears throat> for a university you wanted to attend, um, you would not be able to um, <clears throat> have someone go over uh, your, your resume, your portfolio, and tell you how the model came to that decision. So they're very difficult to unpack. And they're scalable because they're used on millions and millions of people for millions and millions of decisions. They have a, a, a major impact um, on a number of areas of life and decision-making. Uh, Virginia Eubanks is another prominent researcher who looked deeply into the area of um, welfare and social services and eligibility determination for reasons um, mostly having to do with efficiency and trying, trying to drive down costs of government. Many states and the federal government are looking to these models and would like to use them to be able to replace all of the case management that is done by humans. What we're seeing is that um, that's not a good idea, quite frankly. And these, and some of these models are built intendedly to throw people out of the system if they were late, if they failed to document something on time. Um, and the models, as if you had a credit card that uh, assessed very harsh late fees um, or other fees that you didn't know about when you got into the contract. You can design these models as well to do that. Um, and these hurt disproportionately people of color, but, but all of the poor. Um, and so in a country where um, we have increasing inequalities, where because of AI, we are likely to see greater inequalities to layer onto that, these systems that exacerbate bias is really truly just setting up multiple levels of, of harm for people. Um, I'm going to skip over smart cities and get to conclusions. Uh, recently, uh, just uh, this month, um, the Biden administration, um, uh, which has released many executive orders, um, <clears throat> released one, this one, on advancing racial equity and support for underserved communities. Um, this executive order outlines many steps that the administration will take. The one I want to bring your attention to is um, a requirement that every federal agency examine and audit its data sets. Um, what we are, are relearning is that many of our federal data sets, in spite of their presumed potential to bring us into a great new age of AI, are not even disaggregated by race, by ethnicity, by disability, by income, and other key demographic, demographic variables. Um, the cascading effects of these problems in our government data um, are going to be fixed, are going to be remedied. This is going to be a very long process, let me tell you. Um, the Domestic Policy Council, which reports directly to the president, it's part of the executive uh, office of the president, is in the lead. OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, will uh, also be in the lead. The Chief Statistician of the United States and the Chief Technology Officer will co-chair this data work. So it's set at a very high level with ambitious goals. We'll see where it will go. Um, 
The CEO of IBM uh, about six months ago, Arvind Krishna, uh, sent a letter uh, to Congress saying that IBM opposes and will not condone the use of any facial recognition technology and that they would not support uh, other vendors uh, for using it for mass surveillance, for racial profiling, um, and for other areas that infringe on rights and freedoms. At the beginning of this talk, I mentioned the differences, the, the large-scale differences between democratic systems and authoritarian systems. It's not just facial recognition, but the use of many, many advanced computational technologies for surveillance, for profiling, for invasions of privacy that uh, are, are being implemented in very different ways um, in democratic systems and in authoritarian systems where they are quite powerful means for social and political control. We are going to have to construct something in democratic countries, a new understanding of how these technologies uh, can usefully be used that do not harm um, basic civil rights in democracy. Um, one idea is that there should be a new federal office, and this is just for facial recognition, that would work something like the Food and Drug Administration for a particular use of facial recognition. There would be standards, there would be certification, and there would be regulations in the way that you would relate, in the way that you would regulate a medical device um, or a, a new pharmaceutical drug. Um, and that this would be led by uh, a federal, a new federal office. That, that may happen. Um, I think it's feasible. Uh, on the more general point, policy changes are certainly needed um, in order to realize the benefits of these technologies and to mitigate against their problematic uh, features. Um, some have recommended algorithmic impact statements which are like environmental impact statements um, that before something is released, an algorithm, before it is used, um, it needs to go through uh, an assessment. Um, New York City is looking at this. They've launched a task force to study how government algorithms uh, are being used and what their effects are. Canada has in GitHub some examples of algorithmic impact statements. Um, it seems like a very useful idea, and it's a process that is well understood in um, policy analysis. We could use more agile government, the use of pilots, um, using uh, feedback, introducing not just computer learning, but human learning, um, and revisions, rapid revisions, which seems to be a useful approach when you have rapidly changing technologies. Um, let me just close by going back to Richard Nelson, The Moon in the Ghetto, one of the things he found um, in his inquiry was that really to solve some of these very messy problems, we needed to look at institutional structures um, and that the, the layering on of sophisticated quantitative methods was often, he said, a process operating in the intellectual dark, not really recognizing what the problem is about, treating symptoms, being vague about causes, being unclear about alternatives. In a sense, we can manage these problems in a very sophisticated way, but if we want to solve some of these problems, we need other, other approaches in addition to computational algorithms. The reason I entered this work um, is because of uh, uh, the importance of reducing social inequalities and also to be sure that the field of dis digital government research begins to take on these questions and not simply to hype and advance new technologies without fully interrogating them. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, I know it was a bit longer than maybe we wanted, but I'll take questions. Great. Thank you, Professor Fountain, for giving our attendees such deep insights about criminal justice, the role of AI, machine learning algorithms, and the threat to demographic representation that digitization might bring, the challenges that can be reformed in the future to reduce the social inequalities through your impressive, impressive work.
We have a few questions that we'd now answer in the remaining time. So yeah. let's take the first one. How right. would we, uh, this question is by Pravalika. She says, how would we strategically tackle the problem of digital inclusion, digital divide when digitizing government and governmental services? I think this question is very much with respect to India and the situation where the internet accessibility is very low. Yes, uh, so you've already named one, one area, which is access. Um, and, and you might be interested to know that even in, in the United States, we have far too many areas that don't have access. In fact, hill towns, lovely rural towns north of the University of Massachusetts, until recently had no internet access. We have faculty living there and students uh, who would have to come to campus for their access. It's partly uh, because of market externalities and the US approach. So yes, digital access in many countries of the world, digital access means smartphone access. People are not sitting in front of their beautiful MacBooks and other, unless they're quite privileged. So we have to think about how we deliver these various services and capabilities uh, through what's called M government or mobile, mobile phone government. The other area, of course, is education. Turkey for a while was doing a wonderful job teaching uh, many school children all over the country to code and about coding. Right. I, I am not saying that humanities and other areas are not important, but you know, the, uh, I, I think even at the elementary school level, there is no reason for uh, children not to learn coding. And many of them just sort of learn it on their own if they're playing and hacking into various games and systems. Um, in countries that have done this well, the government has really taken the lead. We cannot leave it to the market. It won't happen uh, well or evenly that way. Um, so that that is my answer. Um, Portugal under uh, Jorge Sampao, when he was their president, decided that they would be an information society mm -hmm. that the government would undertake to build the infrastructure to make that happen. So. Okay. Right. So we move on to the next question. Thank you so Indeed. much for answering. And I'll it. be concise. Right. Uh, um, the second question we take from Shakti Sharma. The question is remote neural monitoring growing by, and there's no law against it. So what is your take on this? Um, we really have to look at the potential benefits and the potential harms of any technology and then decide whether um, uh, there are infringements on privacy, obviously, on civil rights. When I was in India, and um, I remember an, an interview with the Times of India in which they said, do you think we should have a privacy provision in our constitution? It's something that was coming up a few years ago. And I thought, yes, of course you should. And I remember talking with some of the government officials who had invited me and they said, no, I, we don't think that that's important to have. <laughs> if you actually look at the US constitution, the word privacy does not appear and we don't have anything explicitly on privacy, but we have other um, citizen rights that allow us to then construct a sense of how privacy should work. But I would say that the information age, I do think, is partially reconstructing our understanding of what privacy means. And um, we have to come to grips with that. I wouldn't say we throw up our hands and say, privacy is dead, get over it, which was a kind of slogan uh, several years ago. That's all I can say on that question. Thank you. I hope Shakti, your question was answered. Uh, we now move to uh, Selja Modem's question. The question says that we are moving forward and tech says that it's going to strengthen democratic structures and it seems like a simplistic way, but one of the major fallouts of tech advancement is it repeatedly runs down the democratic practices. So what do you have to say about it? This area is very less researched, she thinks so, though now this is getting notice, noticed and thank you for highlighting it. Okay, yes, the... Uh, you know, today I talked about computational algorithms and various sources of bias. There are many, many other areas that I think are, are implied in this question. Um, in social media use, how far can speech go? A difficulty 
we are having in the US is uh, we have a first amendment in the constitution, it guarantees free speech. People can actually go very far in their speech before they would be breaking a law. It's very clear, uh, at least to me, that, um, and I know from just uh, reading some news in India and other people can uh, organize insurrections, they can incite people to violence fairly easily on social media and a determined um, uh, effort in this direction is pretty powerful. So um, I think Germany has some uh, very good regulations in this area and it partly comes out obviously of their history. Um, um, and we should, we should look to them. Uh, I do think this cross country benchmarking of things that seem to work that don't seem to work um, is very, very important so that each country right. is not trying to solve these problems in a vacuum, even though we each have our own culture, history, um, um, legal structures, et cetera. Um, but we have a lot of, a lot of uh, issues to work through in the digital age. That's right, that's right. Such an impressive way to say the same thing. So now we'd uh, look to question of Abhinav Arun. I think this is the last question that we take. Do you believe that there are still some loopholes in artificial intelligence? And even if there are loopholes, can social policies make a greater difference? Um, yes, social policies can make an enormous difference. In fact, we need them. We, when I say we, I'm talking about U US mostly and US policy. We would not put, uh, a car on the road that is unsafe. Think about self-driving cars. The big issue is how do we make those self-driving cars safe enough to put them on the road? And what we mean to put it, you know, just very crudely, we don't want people to get killed because of self-driving cars. Um, if an algorithm uh, decides that, nope, you're not getting into this university or nope, your resume will not be considered by this employer, it's not as dramatic as a self-driving car um, causing physical harm, but there are harms there. And we can rectify a lot of those harms through social policies. But what I have observed in decades of research is that we need successive refinements in policies. We try something, we see how it works, we identify the externalities, we go back, we refine. Um, it takes a lot of work. Right, thank you. Uh, I just saw this one very interesting question which is very pertinent to the current situation in India and I thought you would like to answer it. The question is by Chirag. He says Lucknow which is a capital city in India, a state capital, it's planning to deploy facial recognition to spot women in distress. If the government dismisses issues of privacy in favor of its idea of greater good, how can we find balance if it is closing itself to ideas opposing its goal? Uh, yes, it's a great, a great question because specific concrete happening now so uh, a few principles to keep in mind. One is informed consent. So if uh, women, either individual women or a, uh, a mobilized civil society group says, you know what, we are one of the primary stakeholders, obviously, since this is supposed to benefit us, here's what we think. We say, go ahead. That's one uh, issue to think about. Another is, and this is a problem with facial recognition systems. Who else is going to be caught up by the cameras that will be employed? Um, hopefully, if there is a, an assailant, if there is someone troubling um, a, a woman, that that person is identified on camera. Um, but maybe there are other people. Um, so if this camera is always on, um, uh, this is an issue right now in London. The London Metropolitan Police want real-time facial analysis um, that just identifies and uh, is constantly feeding into its facial recognition system, um, the faces of individuals walking by in certain areas. Um, those people may not have given their consent. So it's, uh, if there are, you know, these hotspots to go back to predictive policing, where these kinds of problems seem to be occurring, maybe you begin with those hotspots. Correct. Right. That, that's a great insight into the same issue. 
Thank you. Thank you so much for taking our time to speak on this very pertinent and important issue of enacting digital governance and enlightening all our minds. Our deepest gratitude to all the participants also for their patience and engagement during this session and the faculty members like Ashish sir, VC sir, Lena sir, and Alice Dell and Professor Jane for coming, Chitranjali for coming here and listening to the session patiently and being present. With this, I wish all of you on behalf of JK Lakshmi Path University and UMass Amherst an enjoyable evening. We look forward to hosting you for our next session on the coming Saturday on 27th of February at the very same time, 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. on two very important issues. The first one is how can cities be made more resilient for climate change? And second being water and wheels, the role of non-profits in policy. There will be more stellar academicians from University of Massachusetts Amherst who will be delivering these lectures. Till then, stay safe and connected. Thank you very much. Ed. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Al. Thank you, Ashish, sir. Thank you. It was lovely. Oh, it was lovely to have you here. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. Thank you, Ashish.